Amori is a mix of many different genres and themes. There's a lot to unpack, and it's hard to describe to someone who hasn't played it. But I can tell you where it started. It all began with white space. Amori's liminal space. In high school, after falling asleep in class, I found myself standing in a white room with nothing in it. Realizing it was a dream, panic began setting in, but it was impossible to wake up. Something red and blurry appeared in front of me. After focusing my vision, the red shape morphed into a giant floating rectangular button with the word LIVE written across it. Just like a video game interface. And when I pressed it, I woke up. White Space came to me in a dream. The name White Space comes from a term used in art that refers to the empty areas surrounding an illustration. For the character Amori, a long time ago, Amori was the name of a blog which I used for self-expression and to vent some pretty turbulent feelings as a troubled young adult. Even though they look the same, this Amori is completely different from the one in the final game. The character's loneliness drove me to create a world just for him starting with a self-imposed challenge to fill an entire room by drawing from imagination. This room eventually became Neighbor's Room, the party's playroom. All the things in the room are random, so it might be confusing for people who see it in the game. To further the character's development, I drew a short comic, A Mori Story which featured Amori and the still unnamed Kel, Aubrey, and Hiro interacting for the first time. It was created for a comic anthology, which coincidentally featured as a small thumbnail in Time magazine with Bill Clinton on the cover. Very weird. But anyway. Amori was going to be a graphic novel that began with the protagonist waiting up from a coma. But the more the story developed, the more the cutscenes came to me as game scenarios. The same thoughts kept occurring to me. This moment would work better as a game. Or it would be better if the audience had a choice here. As a beginner to game development and a fan of RPG Maker horror games, the best choice to make a Mori was unquestionably an RPG Maker. There are three main worlds in Amori. Headspace, a dream world. Black Space, a nightmare world. And Faraway Town, a realistic world. Each world fulfills their own purpose and are visually set apart using different color palettes. Amori's headspace was created gradually during development. An imaginary dream world needs to have a sense of spontaneity and randomness. So it felt natural to create concepts on the spot. As artists, there's always things that we find comfortable drawing without the use of reference. My goal was to think very little and let my stream of consciousness flow, much like in a dream. Headspace is based on the idea of lucid dreaming. It was created to be playful, whimsical, and colorful to contrast the other parts of the game, such as Faraway Town and Black Space. The protagonist needed an expansive world that he could escape to. A lot of classic RPGs include environments like deserts, forests, and caves so those types of worlds were added with a fun spin. Also included were pensive environments like foggy piers, quiet trains, 
or a giant field of grass to add an eerie feeling to the world. Vast forest is a pun on the name Omori, since Omori reads as vast forest in Japanese. Some worlds were based on my own experiences. Last Resort and Underwater Highway are inspired by road trips my family took to Las Vegas, channeling memories of experiencing a casino as a kid. Headspace is not exactly surreal, but more so a world viewed through the eyes of a child. While conceptualizing, the team did group brainstorming sessions where we released our inner children. We made up silly and fun scenarios with no reasoning or purpose. Things that made us laugh. If a joke made everyone laugh, we put it in the game, like ramen in toilets or eternal banana. Fast Forest and Otherworld were remade a few times after early production to keep up with the current style of the game. But dungeons like Sweetheart's Castle and Humphrey were only workshop for only a week or even days. Since our programming resources were limited, we couldn't test any dungeons out for a long time. It was risky to try anything too complicated within the time frame. Despite limitations, I'm still happy with what we ended up with. Except Humphrey. I just want to blow him up. But since there are some serious Humphrey lovers on the team, I guess he can stay for now. Blockspace had content that was most exciting to make. To counteract a lucid dream, Blockspace represents one's subconscious, thoughts you can't control. As you travel deeper, the environment becomes more unusual and unpredictable. Like Headspace, much of Blackspace's content was drawn from imagination. But instead of brainstorming with friends, I conceptualized it alone. The first version of Blackspace was an open world where the player could wander and get lost. But the pace was too slow for that point in the game. The world was remade into bite-sized rooms so it could be experienced without worrying about game progression. At first, the worlds appeared in a random order, like jumping through different pools of consciousness. But it became clear that the sequence required more emotional intention. The order became fixed while retaining the illusion of randomness. The music tracks made for Blackspace inspired its imagery. Since they were created first, I listened to these tracks on repeat, until scenarios and imagery came to mind. Inspiration came from my own fears and even memories of nightmare fuel from childhood. There's a scene where Basil gets eaten by a bunch of spiders based on the death scene of the antagonist in this movie called We're Back, A Dinosaur Story. The antagonist gets covered by a bunch of crows and disappears. But my childhood mind translated it to that he was eaten alive. The room of faceless characters was inspired by a show where a bunch of faceless aliens were trying to kidnap a woman. It's still scary to think about now. Lastly, Faraway Town is based on suburban America, a nostalgic and charming world that you would know in real life. Being exposed to different types of households inspired a variety of households in Faraway Town. The same kind of mundane and familiar places, supermarkets, hardware stores, parks, and churches serve their own little communities across America. 
The themes of Faraway Town are also developed from my own experiences. I took piano lessons and performed in small recitals. Had interest in photography, flower assortment, cooking, and more. And as a loner, I watched other children play from afar and dreamt of an ideal childhood. But also, my uncontrollable, overactive imagination haunted my dreams. At night, I hallucinated something next to me or at the foot of the bed, dissuading me from sleeping alone for a long time. Vivid lucid dreams took over restful nights and I would try to escape them through death by, for instance, jumping into a lake. Sleep paralysis plagued me so frequently, it became possible to tell if I was going to experience it before falling asleep. Shadows appeared in the corner of the room, or a baby would be heard crying in the distance. It's all pretty creepy stuff that probably influenced the game quite a bit. So basically, Amori is like if every one of my thematically relevant life experiences were jammed into one game. When creating it, I thought of it as the first and only game I would ever make. So that's probably why. Like the world, Amori's story developed a lot during the creative process. The premise was that two worlds were hiding the same dark secret, and that secret would be revealed through both worlds simultaneously. When the game was planned to be experimental, the story was drastically different. After the game's first delay, the narrative evolved to have more impact so it could rise to the game's expectations. Amori's plot was risky. The themes of the story are incredibly important and were difficult to execute, but they filled me with passion and excitement. Honestly, it felt like I was onto something, since the more I worked on it, the more everything else fell into place. Amori's story serves the emotional journey of the protagonist. The story is very simple to summarize, but the experience focuses on much more than just going through a sequence of events. Amori's narrative structure is not typical and utilizes symbolism generously. There are many hidden secrets to uncover, so the experience becomes what you make of it. The juxtaposition of the stories and settings gives opportunity to create interesting moments. There's a time and place for everything. Most of the time. Worlds are set in each world. So when the game breaks its barriers, those moments become more potent. A wise sage once told me, feels before reels. But there are limits. At some point, Basil had a gun, and I tried to write that his grandma was a hunter to explain it. But obviously, that was cut for being too silly. The final plot was chosen because it could be a believable circumstance. It makes the story more haunting. Amori is a horror game after all. There's a thought of, this could have really happened. This could have happened to me. Sunline protagonists like Red from Pokemon or Link from Zelda have always been my favorite characters. But it's assumed that these protagonists are silent for self-insert reasons. It was interesting to create a silent protagonist in which the silence is a part of their personality. That's how the idea of Sunny was born. Someone who doesn't say anything like a silent protagonist, but actually he thinks a lot. 
His awkwardness and mannerisms are based on my own from high school, but his hair and clothing is based on my elementary school friend. When I was a kid, it was difficult to make friends with people in my class because of bullying. My only friend was a boy one grade higher than me. We would walk along the school track talking about politics and religion. He was the only one that would listen to me ramble about strange subjects. The clothing that Sunny, Mari, and Basil wear was my school's uniform from elementary to high school. Likewise, all the characters are inspired by parts of myself or people in my life. If I talk about how they were developed from beginning to end, we might be here all day, so I'll be brief. Other than Sunny, a character that mirrors my personal experiences is Aubrey. Aubrey's character comes from my transition from childhood to young adulthood. My parents said as a kid I was very sweet and would always be friendly to strangers. But as a result of negative experiences, I became closed off and quiet. But really, my insides were filled with anger. As for appearance, there was a phase where I had long dyed hair and wore barber jackets and headbands in college. That's a more direct reference. She's a troubled individual, but actually quite composed unless you agitate her. I always wanted to be someone as cool as Aubrey. While Aubrey is based on my own emotions, Kel was created in relation to Sunny's personality. Since Sunny is a passive person, needs an energetic individual like Kel to push the story along. Without him, it'd be quite boring in Faraway Town, wouldn't it? In high school, I was like Sunny. Comfortable as a quiet friend who tagged along with loud and exciting individuals. Kel is based on those friends and experiences. He's someone who is always there for you and loves you unconditionally. Even though he can be a little troublesome, you can tell he cares about you and puts others' feelings above his own. Kel loves making others happy to a fault, or he finds it hard to deal with his own feelings. I'm sure we all know someone like that. And I'm sure we all know someone who we lend money to and don't expect to be paid back. But we love them anyway. If I could relate Hero to one person, it would be my brother. My brother is smart, responsible, and was always at the top of the class. But funnily enough, he's also deathly afraid of spiders. Like Hero, he is diligently pursuing a medical degree despite being passionate in other interests. My sister and I were the Kells of the family. Hero is the type of character that seems perfect to outsiders, but after spending more time with them, you discover that they're actually kind of lame. That's not a bad thing, though. Getting to know their imperfections makes you love them even more. Similar to Hiro, Mari seems perfect on the outside, but is hiding a lot on the inside. Maybe that's why they make such a good match. In Headspace, Mari's perfectionist tendencies are well hidden, but present in other places. Like Mari, I'm a perfectionist, so I understand how she feels. Early on, Mari was one of Sunny's friends, but that was changed to make the story more impactful. As a big sister, I do things for my younger siblings even if they don't notice it most of the time. Then there are friends who worry about me and take care of me like older sisters. Mari's personality is a result of examining those relationships. And last but not least, 
There's the gentle and compassionate Basil. He's a sixth ranger type of character whose absence makes the heart grow fonder. Basil has changed the most since the beginning. At first, he was a sweet boy named Flower, who was well put together like Mari. And then he became a very angsty boy named Rowan, kind of like Aubrey. In the end, Basil took from both Flower's and Rowan's personalities and became his own interesting character. Basil is deeply caring and thoughtful, especially when it comes to his friends. But his loneliness and insecurity makes him dependent on others, sometimes dangerously so. He feels very deep emotions for those he cares about. And because of this, they can sometimes put him in a situation where he will unintentionally hurt others and himself. All the characters have their own complexities, but Basil is probably the most complicated character and ended up being the most fun to write for. Anyway, I'm very embarrassed right now for revealing all of this. The characters in Mori evolved in my head for a long time. While developing them, I thought, Wow, these characters are so lovable. How can I get other people to see how wonderful they are too? Their dialogue was written like conversations with real people. Sometimes it felt like writing down my inner monologues. You can say I write from experience. In early development, a lot of different methods were experimented with to create Amori's maps, using crayons and color pencils. Headspace was going to look drastically different from Faraway Town, and was to be surreal and nonsensical. I had to scrap this for two main reasons. First, having the world be drawn in crayon visually separated the characters from the setting too much making the world less immersive. The more experimental processes were moved to black space. Secondly, a world with no structure isn't truly random. It still needs to be implemented and tested to make sure all the components can work together. Without proper care, a structureless world can feel unintentionally clumsy and contrived. Since it's less straightforward to explain to a team, it can take a long time to get the desired result. That is, unless you're also programming the game yourself. During early development, Amori's programming was making little progress, so coordinating efficiently seemed out of reach. Much later, after I learned how to program, it was possible to achieve a more experimental result in black space by programming the base myself. Both worlds ended up having the same pixel style. It worked for the game's narrative and showed the protagonist's struggles separating the worlds. Solidifying headspace was challenging. The freedom was almost limiting. Its purpose is to illustrate the protagonist's ideal relationship with his childhood friends. Even though my initial goal was to create a surreal world like in other games I love, such as Space Funeral or Hylix, nonsensical adventures would detract from getting to know these characters. Without Headspace's goofy but definable scenarios, it would be much harder to visualize the protagonist's childhood relationships with his friends. The idea was to write two overarching storylines from Headspace and Faraway Town that would eventually meld together. But without programming support, being unable to test how the narrative felt in-game made such an ambitious goal too risky. 
with little room to experiment, I decided for Headspace to be an episodic series of campy adventures based on Saturday morning cartoons with a simple overarching theme. Find Basil. This quest would continue to derail as the world was trying to keep the protagonist from the truth. Music played a huge component in visualizing Amori's world. To set the right tone for the tracks, I drew small thumbnails to show the feelings the track should evoke. The music drafts inspired how the areas would look. Sometimes, the songs would even influence the story. Sweetheart was an optional boss. But because her battle theme was so good, she became a mandatory part of the story. A lot of music was completed before implementation, so many of Amori's worlds were reverse engineered. The game's details only existed in document files, handwritten notes, and spreadsheets for years. After becoming the lead programmer, my workdays were 20 hours long to make up for lost time, so ideas were being improved quickly. It would have been too difficult for everyone to keep track of the changes. Instead, the entire team was taking requests from me left and right, helping with various parts of development. Amori entirely changed in 2020. Without that last year, it would have been a completely different game. The duet animation wasn't created until April that year. We completed 25 hand-drawn animations in 2020 alone. The emotions battle triangle didn't exist until that September. Even the different stages of the final battle weren't conceived until a few months before release. There was a week where I updated over 300 maps. We even revamped all of Humphrey in just days. Just like the concepts, the execution of the worlds were created with very quick gut decisions. In 2020, my brain was on overdrive trying to get this game out. Every decision had to be made quickly. So I'm grateful that the team trusted me and my vision. Since the project started out with one artist, Amori doesn't have much formal visual development work, but doodles and explorative illustration drafts. The assets were worked on separately, but because of our programming issues, they couldn't be pieced together as a game. The closest thing to a game I had were my visual mockups in Photoshop. With no way to experience the gameplay or cutscenes, Amori was almost entirely conceptualized in my head. I imagined the relationships between the game's art and the gameplay, how the player would feel throughout the game, how the cutscenes would play out, dialogue, character expression, even character sprites movement. Every night, I played the game in my head, mentally fixing up the narrative structure and making sure that the story and gameplay meshed together. When an idea came to me, I'd write it in a notebook, even from the shower. Sometimes an idea would compel me to get out of bed at 3 a.m. and start working on it immediately. To organize my thoughts, these lists of ideas were organized into spreadsheets. When transitioning to a team, our time was utilized creating assets to get the game out as fast as possible. Instead of creating concepts, I reviewed everyone's work at the end and made the final edits to fit my vision. 
but sometimes we explored character relationships by drawing fun doodles. Amori was completed by working. Working a lot. And I mean a lot. It took discipline, determination, and dedication. Oh, and spreadsheets. Lots and lots of spreadsheets. My first years were spent mostly alone. As the team grew, a new set of work emerged, organizing everyone's schedules. It was important to get to know every individual's work style and pace, so each process could lead to the next without delay. All members needed to communicate clearly while completing their own tasks, so spreadsheets were very useful. A truly unbelievable amount of spreadsheets. Creating good spreadsheets is invaluable. They organize important information and solidify intangible ideas into real tasks that can be accomplished. Every single map used to make a mori is tied to a number. All 473 of them. For instance, white space is map 87 and forest playground is map 92. There was a huge spreadsheet that kept track of every character and enemy stat in the game. Each enemy had different stats depending on their emotion. So imagine every enemy in Amori multiplied by 4. There was a spreadsheet for items, their effects, and descriptions. There was a sheet that kept track of the side quest rewards and sequences to see if, for instance, Completing quest A on day 1 should grant access to quest B on day 2. There was a sheet that listed 1000 game switches, a tool used to track a player's progress. Spreadsheets were also our to-do lists, which eventually became filled with bugs. Thousands of them. From each section, I assign bugs to different people based on their skill sets. With the process so complicated, it's important to accept that, especially in game development, nothing will ever be 100% perfect. In long-term projects, there will always be something you feel like you can do better. In video games, there will always be bugs. Unless you resist the urge to fix everything, the game will never come out. A big part of development is learning to prioritize what's important. It requires working hard, but also working smart. The world needs more unique and genuine art. There's a common saying, shoot for the moon. Even if you miss, you'll land amongst the stars. Go as far as your dreams will take you. The road is filled with danger, but even if you stumble and fall, you might find yourself somewhere new and exciting. It's not over until you give up. Thanks for listening. I hope this talk was able to give you a little bit of insight. Kyou wa takusan kitte kurete ureshi desu. Itsu mo oen shite kurete arigato gozaimasu.